Welcome back. Hoping to inspire you to read your Bible every single day. Zero excuse. And well, I hope it's working. We're coming to you in our brand new media room. It's not quite finished yet. We're taking steps along the way, but it's why you see me in the same clothes over and over and over because I'm pretending it's another day ha, when it's really the same day and I'm wearing the same clothes. Or I can pretend like I have six of these. <laughs> I like them so much, the red tablecloth look. Well, we're getting used to it and we're kind of trying to take the Bible reading up a notch a little bit. Why? We want to inspire you to read it every day. Acts chapter one, all week long this week. No, oh, look, it's only five verses today. 15 all the way down to verse 20. And man, it just gets deeper and deeper every week. I hope you've recovered from yesterday's reading. Whew, it stung a bit <laughs> when you feel like you're giving up on God because, well, you think he gave up on you. Let's jump right in. Verse 15, here we go. During this time, when about 120 believers were together in one place, Peter stood up and addressed them. Brothers, he said, the scriptures had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who guided those who arrested Jesus. This was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit, speaking through King David. Judas was one of us, and he shared in the ministry with us. Judas had bought a field with the money he received for his treachery, falling head first there, his body split open, <laughs> okay, spilling out his intestines. The news of his death spread to all the people of Jerusalem, and they gave the place the Aramaic name al kadama which means filled of blood. Peter continued, this was written in the book of Psalms where it says, let his home become desolate with no one living in it. It also says, let someone else take his position. I just want you to think a minute about Judas Iscariot. He always gets a bum rap. He's always the one we throw under the bus. He's the turncoat. <laughs> He's the one that lost his place of leadership. He's the one that blew it. And yet he was chosen by Jesus. Almost seems like it's unfair. It almost feels like he was set up by God so God could destroy him and use him that way. I mean, if you really think about it, Jesus already knew that Judas Iscariot would betray him and then therefore, ha ha, decided to pick him anyway. Don't you love that, Jesus? It's almost like that those of us who believe that the fate of God overrides everything, fate versus free will, gotcha. Judas Iscariot must prove that because it seems like, well, he really did not even have a choice. Judas Iscariot was chosen from the beginning of time to sell out Jesus Christ. And well, when he was born, Jesus came. And then therefore, weird idea here, Jesus couldn't have even come until Judas had been born if Judas was set up pre-time to trade Jesus out. So really the birth of Jesus isn't even that important. The birth of Judas must be more important because Judas is the one that's gonna trade him out. Oh, just too deep. It's just way too deep. Let's back up and do it real simple. Did God know that Judas would betray him? And if he did, why did he pick him? And if he did betray him, didn't he even have a choice? Or did God force his hand? Well, what we read here is that Jesus picked Judas Iscariot and well knew from the beginning that Judas would betray him. And yet he picked him anyway. So let's just say this, one thing we know about that, Jesus offers great grace because he knew he would betray him. He knew that he would be the one that would be the turncoat and well, sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. And if you really wanna look that up, go check out the book of Exodus. 30 pieces of silver was the price paid for a slave. So it's almost as if Judas is saying, I'm following God willingly, following Jesus willingly, but my perception and my thoughts of Jesus are he's not really a king, he's nothing more than my slave. In other words, he exists to fulfill what I need him to exist to fulfill. And what was that? Well, it's what all 12 of the men were thinking that are called apostles. Jesus existed as a king to bring about their desire for the Jews to overthrow Rome. 
So from their mentality, Jesus existed for their benefit. Jesus existed to push their agenda. Jesus existed to fulfill their desires of political conquest. Judas was no different. Judas just happened to be the one that, well, kind of lends into what it's all about because by taking 30 pieces of silver and being the one that took it, he was simply making this statement, and here's the statement he made. Though Jesus claims to be king, he's really a slave to me because he's going to do what I need him to do, which is to take over the world and bring his kingdom. You see, I think when Judas traded Jesus out, he thought distinctly different that it would go and turn out the opposite of how it turned out. He thought by trading Jesus out, Jesus would actually move his kingdom forward. By trading Jesus out, it would force his hand. So Judas's thinking is my actions will force the hand of God to make God do what I want God to do for me. And a lot of us live that way today. We take our emotions and our actions to force the hand of God to do for me what I need him to do. So therefore we get mad at him, we pout, we whine, and we cry because we feel like if we do it enough, maybe I could coerce him into doing what I really need him to do for me. And then therefore it's almost as if I am the king and he is my servant. He serves me. Well, that's most of us today. But yet Judas Iscariot becomes the one who on the night Jesus was betrayed, Jesus looked at him and said, Judas, go do whatever's in your heart to do. And Judas gets up from that communion table, having taken the bread and the wine, and the Bible says, and Satan filled his heart. That's amazing to me that the grace of Jesus picked Judas Iscariot but because of Judas's perceptions, his perceptions of God became an open door for Satan to use him to advance his kingdom. Here's what I want you to think about today. Sometimes you can be really passionate about Jesus, passionate about him using you, passionate about religion, and yet at the same time, your perceptions are wrong. And when your perceptions are wrong, it can be an open door for Satan to use you to promote his own kingdom. Your perceptions are wrong about the Lord. You want him to tap dance for you. You want him to, well, serve you. And when your perceptions are wrong, it becomes an open door in your life for Satan to, well, work his magic and literally bring you to a place to where your entire life, well, doesn't become everything you wished it would become. So I wanna challenge you today. Are your perceptions about God skewed? Do you think that God exists to serve you, exists to bring your kingdom about, your will about, your happiness about? Or are you really good to say, he's not my slave, I'm his slave. That's what the Bible calls a servant, a willing bond slave. Lord, anything you would have me to do, I'll do it. Hey, I've taught you that prayer all week this week. Lord, if you can use anything, you can use me. That's the heart of a servant, the heart of a slave who serves. Paul called himself a bond slave. And if anybody comes across my path today that needs you, may I ever be so bold to lead them to you. That's my prayer for you today. Ask God to show you the perceptions in your heart and then take those perceptions and submit them to him and say, God, I yield it all to you. Let your kingdom come and your will be done in my life. Hey, I'll see you tomorrow. It's gonna be a good day as we wrap up the week. Be blessed. It's gonna be a blast.